Okay, so next up we have Fadim, and he will be talking about a very long topic. Uh, Google Security Chip H1, a member of the Titan family. Big welcome. <coughs> Thank you. So um, H1 is a chip which was uh, designed by Google. At some point, some, um, there are actually a lot of uh, paranoid people at Google, which, uh, and rightly so, I might say, uh, which, uh, who thought that we uh, need to be able to control everything from the very beginning. And uh, so there, there is a group of um, chip designers, which I'm not part of, certainly, which designed this chip for, with many different applications in mind at Google. And uh, at some point it was decided that um, Chrome OS would be also a good uh, use case for that. And um, Chrome OS actually gave them a lot of inputs into what uh, could be done uh, special for the uh, uh, you know, typical uh, secure computer user uh, uh, um, uh, computers which are used by, uh, you know, people outside uh, enterprise. And uh, this chip came along, and uh, so this is uh, what's inside. So it has an ARM core, <coughs> and then it has uh, fairly limited resources. It has 8 kilobytes of ROM, which is programmed uh, uh, at the chip factory, so it cannot be changed. It has 64 kilobytes of SRAM, 500 kilobytes of flash, one uh, important piece, it has a crypto engine, which is um, basically uh, speeds up crypto operations, and it also provides uh, secure key ladders, which can be um, enabled or disabled. Uh, the keys could be hidden depending on the mode of operation of the chip. Then it has a bunch of peripherals, uh, US USB controller, uh, I2C for master and slave, spy master and slave, GPIOs, UARTs, uh, it has also a very good uh, random generator. I'm not pushing this. So the random number generator is um, a lot of uh, uh, hard effort was put into designing this, and it is uh, claimed to be truly random, uh, as, as random as it could be. And it also has this... Uh, <laughs> 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 and it has the uh, uh, circuit for uh, sensing... Um, a debug cable plugged in, and then it kind of uh, brings to life a whole new personality of this chip, which we can talk uh, later about, or we'll talk later about. And of course, there is a PinMax, uh, which um, um, allows to co uh, connect different peripherals to different pins on the chip. And there is this uh, so-called R-Box, which is a subsystem which controls power and reset and is completely independent from the CPU. It kind of it's run on a very low level, and it's one of the things which uh, makes, uh, contributes into the root of trust of Chrome, Chromebooks. So uh, the, this is about the flash memory, how program fits into the flash. So we have 512 kilobytes, but uh, to be uh, able to recover from bad images and to um, uh, avoid the, you know, breaking the system, uh, this flash is actually split in two halves, which are very symmetrical, almost symmetrical. Uh, so there is uh, 16 kilobytes of so-called read-only. It is, um, I guess it's a misnomer because it still can be changed. And then there is uh, 230 something kilobytes, which is dedicated to read-write. And then uh, there is 12 kilobytes, which is dedicated to non-volatile memory. And this is duplicated, so there are two of these uh, halves. And um, uh, so each read-only and read-write both, they have the same uh, header pre uh, uh, preceding them. And the header has uh, all kind of information in it, uh, including um, means of integrity check and verifying the uh, version of this header. So basically when... Uh, the code executes each earlier state, each earlier version. We have ROM, read-only, and read-write. Can check the later version versions, uh, uh, the later stages version, and uh, 
decide which one to run. Each earlier stage can decide which later stage to run depend, uh, based on the header contents. So the code, all, the all code for, uh, for this uh, CR50, this, by the way, this uh, particular project uh, uh, running on the chip is called CR50 for not entirely uh, clear. I think this is one of the isotopes of uh, chromium, which is like less and less stable, but this actually, <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, it is a, it's not the rightful name anymore. So the code comes from, uh, it is from the Chrome OS uh, EC repo and the board files are in board CR50 and the chip files are in chip G and this is the uh, git, uh, get it, uh, storage, uh, get it server which stores this uh, code. So um, uh, someone mentioned today earlier that uh, TPM uh, from Infineon is completely closed. We don't know anything about its internals. I uh, uh, can say that I'm running a little bit ahead of myself, but the code, the TPM code in, uh, th on this device is completely open. It is uh, courtesy of Microsoft, actually. We have uh, some early versions uh, retrieved from some Microsoft documents which were put on their uh, open source license and integrated into this uh, chip, so it is uh, totally transparent. Um, so I want to say a little bit about firmware updates. We kind of uh, were thinking about this, uh, and it kind of evolved while we were working on it, but what we ended up with was that the chip, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention this here, but I didn't. So it, uh, uh, along with this um, 512 kilobytes of flash, it also has this so-called info space, which is also essentially flash, but it is not accessed directly. It can be, uh, it, uh, it needs to be enabled in a special way. It is split into four, uh, it is t just two kilobytes of it. It's split into four pages. So, and one of those pages is used for um, uh, storing chip properties. So each chip uh, gets assigned a um, board ID, which is like, which is just a 32-bit word value which uh, happens to match the name of the board in Chrome OS speak. Uh, uh, and then this value is also saved uh, inverted so that no erasing one bit can, uh, can go undetected. And it has the board flags, which um, yet another uh, knob we can use to uh, control what images run on this system. And it also has a 512 byte space, which actually used as 128 bits, what happens is that this bitmap uh, space, this uh, info one space rather, it is very sensitive to uh, write operations and uh, you pretty much cannot write more than four times into the same 32-bit word. So this is why we had to pretty much use a byte for a, or actually a word for a, for a bit in that, in that case. So, and then the uh, image, which uh, loads, in, which runs into the, on this device. So this is now the header I'm talking about. Uh, so this header also has the bitmap, the board ID, uh, which consists of uh, board ID, board ID mask, and board flags, and the version, which is just uh, three arbitrary numbers and the timestamp. So what happens when the image um, is loaded on the chip, the earlier stage checks that uh, the bitmaps match so that uh, if a bit is cleared in this um, space but not in this space, the image is not accepted. Then it also checks that the board ID match and of course we can create an image. Uh, the mask um, defines which bits from board ID are used for comparison. So if we set the mask to zero, this would mean that this image can run on any device, on any chip. But we can also, if we want to release an image which can run only on certain chips on certain boards, then we can set this board ID mask to all ones and the exact board ID will have to be, will have to match. And then there is the board flags field, which also again, any flag set to uh, one in the board uh, in the chip uh, space must be set to one in the image, otherwise the image will not be accepted. So all these, uh, kind of tricks are necessary so that we can uh, 
this allows this to be very flexible. We can both uh, create an image which would run on any chip, or we can create an image which would run only on certain chips, uh, only on certain boards, which, are, which have only certain flags set. This allows us to release um, a, a test and experimental firmware, and we are not afraid that this would leak uh, into the open and start uh, running on all devices. So that's uh, how the uh, updates are controlled. So uh, major functions of this chip are, uh, which this chip uh, provides in the system are guaranteed reset, including battery cutoff, then closed case debugging, which is this extension which was put into the chip uh, based on our uh, request. The verified boot is pretty much a TPM, and then Another nice thing is that being able to control the firmware of this chip allows us to tightly integrate it with the rest of the Chrome OS and make it support a lot of uh, Chrome OS features which uh, make Chrome OS more usable and uh, more uh, user and uh, manufacturer friendly. So reset and power are controlled by this uh, unit which we called Rbox in the beginning here. So as I said, it is pretty much separate uh, block on the chip. And it has a few uh, uh, functions. So first of all, it allows uh, uh, to um, provide unspoofed reset. This, uh, this is a keyboard mat matrix which actually goes into the EC. So one of the components of, the, of a laptop, of course, is the embedded controller, which among other things, controls power to the AP, and it controls the keyboard, and uh, it controls the reset of the system. So uh, the, we want to be sure that if the user, that the user has a way to reset the EC in an unspoofable way. So for that, the keyboard matrix, two elements, one row and one column, go through, through the R box, and then when the user pushes the power button and the refresh button, the, these signals in our box hardware, in our box logic, make sure that it generates the EC reset uh, uh, signal. So that this basically gives the user a uh, guaranteed way of resetting the system, which cannot be spoofed. Another nice uh, uh, capability is the ability to control write protect to the flash where the BIOS is. So earlier Chromebook versions required the user to open it up and remove the um, write protect screw to allow uh, updating firmware. With this chip, uh, under um, uh, in a controlled uh, environment, the user, the owner of the device, can uh, uh, enable write protect without opening up the chip. We'll, we'll talk about this a bit later. And another nice feature of this is the battery cutoff, so that if uh, the user um, presses these two buttons and removes the AC cord, this generates a pulse uh, on the uh, battery's cutoff input, and the battery basically disconnects itself from the system. So this, is, this makes it um, uh, easy for shelf storage of the device for a long time, and then just plugging in AC power revives the battery. So TPM interface uh, is uh, it's basically a function which uh, used to be implemented by uh, Infineon chips in Chromebooks. But in this case, it is a TPM2 specification. The, uh, each one can be connected to the AP both over I2C or SPI. This is uh, controlled by bootstrap uh, resistors, which are read when each one is uh, uh, reset and the important distinction is that the TPM reset is not H1 reset so that uh, the H1 stays up at all times and it controls the system. Uh, TPM reset is just the resetting of the task which one of the uh, parts of software. It's kind of, um, it took a little uh, or maybe quite a few tricks <coughs> to make it work right but this is why I mention it here. <clears throat> so TPM support of verified boot in Chrome OS is uh, not new, but it also uh, ported into TPM uh, version 2 specification. So TPM uh, contains the uh, uh, NVMM uh, indexes for rollback counters for firmware and kernel. 
so this, this is AP firmware, obviously, so that um, the older versions of firmware cannot be run on the system uh, when there is a need to uh, roll forward. Another, What's AP? AP is application processor. It's like the main CPU of this. So I guess the, that's kind of a terminology. So the, each uh, laptop or PC has the application processor, which is the x86 in most cases, or, or ARM. And then they has the EC, which is a smaller device, which controls the power for, a, for the rest of the system. And now it has this H1, which controls the EC, basically. So it also contains, it also um, stores the cache of the memory reference code. Uh, there were some uh, talks about uh, how, uh, I mean, Julius mentioned this for ARM, but it is even more painful for x86. Uh, memory initialization on a cold uh, CPU on recent uh, um, x86 uh, devices, it takes 30, 40 seconds for the uh, uh, DDR controller uh, or memory reference code, I should say, which comes from Intel and is a closed code, unfortunately, uh, to train memory and figure out how it should be run. So it's like 40, 40, 40 seconds for a boot is uh, quite long. So. What we do is we, once this uh, memory reference code ran and uh, calculated all the um, uh, parameters for this particular controller, for this particular run, uh, it saves all this memory, all this information into the flash and calculates the hash of it and we save the hash in the TPM in one of the indices. So when the system reboots, it checks, it reads the memory reference code cache from uh, flash, compares the SHA, and if it is okay, then it goes right ahead. And this allows us to uh, compress the boot time immensely. Another thing is the firmware management parameters. This is a uh, thing which allows uh, enterprise managers to prevent, for instance, turning Chromebook into a developer device. So that if, uh, Enterprise buys a bunch of uh, Chromebooks. They don't want the users to be able to replace their firmware, even though otherwise we want Chromebooks to be completely open. So uh, this uh, firmware man management parameters is a um, set of flags which are saved in the TPM, uh, stored in the TPM. And if certain flags are set, the device will not turn into dev mode, even though the user will try to turn it on, uh, uh, convert it. And the device mode state is also saved there so that even if a uh, uh, user puts there a completely different uh, firmware, the device still can run in developer mode. <coughs> so this is uh, uh, how the uh, closed case debugging system works. So it is uh, possible to enable it only when user physical presence is confirmed by pressing the power button uh, a certain amount of times in certain modes. But basically what happens, there is a debug cable which is plugged in into the USB-C interface. And the debug cable uh, creates a very specific uh, voltages on the two of the CC lines, which the chip can uh, detect. And then once the chip detects this, it can enable uh, uh, you are, uh, it can enable USB controller to uh, channel all UARTs into the US, uh, I2C SPI interfaces into the uh, USB endpoints. So there are also uh, SVU lines are used for uh, creating uh, for uh, for keeping the USB interface with the, with the rest of the with the uh, uh, host basically. So once uh, this debug uh, uh, mode is enabled, which again can be enabled only if the device is not in, in developer mode, so that uh, the user first has to have their Chromebooks uh, converted from a normal, so-called normal mode when the uh, boot process is fully controlled to the developer mode where things can be changed then the user has the ability to enable this uh, functionality through uh, giving the device certain uh, commands from the uh, Linux prompt. 
Then once this uh, so-called SUSE cable plugged in, which, has, which creates this uh, <coughs> uh, voltages on the CC lines, all this, this magic happens. So at this point, the user can uh, disable write protect so that both EC and AP flash chips can be written. And then the MAXs, which uh, connect SPI buses from EC and AP to their uh, respective chips, can be switched, and the, the SPI uh, master interface on the H1 can control these uh, uh, flash uh, devices. So basically, this is the way to, for the user to replace firmware on the computer, and this is what makes it open. And uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, we have um, I2C interface, uh, which uh, in certain cases it, it is used for programming uh, flash uh, on some ECs. It also used for power management uh, when the device is still in development. This power management hardware is not uh, populated on production devices, but it is very helpful when uh, the device has been <coughs> uh, debugged still, so power uh, people can always know what's going on there. So, and again, this is what makes this uh, chip very useful and helpful for Chrome OS because in your, de in your designs, uh, there is not even, uh, some of them are sh glue shut so that you, one can't open them to remove the uh, right protection screw, but we still want them to be uh, accessible to users so that they can uh, do what they want with their devices. So, and these are a few things which uh, this chip allows the rest of the system, uh, like a Chrome OS as a whole, to achieve. Uh, so, a lot of uh, them related, uh, related to servicing the devices when they uh, are returned from, from users. So, for instance, <coughs> RMA verification is a mode when uh, a Chrome OS device uh, which is, which was returned from uh, by the user uh, in the store. Bef they don't really want to send it back to the factory or to the RMA center if they don't have to. So one of the means of uh, uh, verifying that they want to be sure that the AP and AC firmware hasn't been altered in this uh, computer by the user before they returned it. So the this magic uh, SUSE Q cable I was talking about connects the device on the test and the master Chrome OS device. And the master Chrome OS device sends a command to this H1, which uh, makes sure that the H1 puts the rest of the system into reset. And then the master tells the H1, read the following uh, sections of flash and cal calculate their hashes. So, which the H1 does, and the master has a table which uh, contains the values from these hashes, uh, these, uh, these uh, areas, uh, hashes these areas are supposed to have, and uh, co uh, con uh, compares them. So, if they, are, if they match, this means that the firmware hasn't been modified, so that the, this uh, um, Chromebook can be just reimaged and put back on the shelf. If they don't match, this means something else needs to be done, so it has to be sent to the uh, RMA center. And this is what happens in the RMA center. So we still have this. So one of the things the RMA center will want to do is to re-image the flash of the, uh, of the device, of the computer. And for that, they need to uh, enable, right, uh, enable right into the flash. So. Again, instead of opening the device, removing the right protect screw where it is, as they do today with the devices, or they have been had been doing until recently, and this is something they can't even do with the uh, uh, um, glued uh, devices. We have a me mechanism to allow uh, um, authenticated users. So basically, this is the exchange between the, H, between the Chromebook and the RMA server, where the RMA server can authenticate the user. It also can authenticate that this is the uh, device the, uh, which claims it is, the, uh, it is, and then send the user a code 
to uh, which allows to uh, disable write protect. So this is done using uh, ECC Diffie-Hellman uh, algorithm. The uh, on the on the H1 side, it generates a random number which it uses as a private key for this for a certain uh, uh, ECC curve. Then it calculates the public key, and the uh, server public key is a, a well-known uh, number, of course. So then the uh, H1 calculates a secret, knowing its private key and the server uh, public key in the <coughs> in this ECC space, and then it uh, creates a challenge. Sorry, then it calculates the authentication code, which will allow to uh, unlock this board. So it can, it, uh, to calculate this code, it takes the uh, secret, this uh, private key it calculated, the board ID, device ID, and then creates an HMAC of them, which uh, ends up being a 40-bit value. And then it creates a challenge for the server, where it uh, uses the server... Uh, uh, which it, it uh, uses its own public key, which was derived from the private key, in the same board ID and device ID, and send them to the server. So the server uh, verifies that the authenticated user has uh, rights to modify firmware uh, for this particular board ID. Board ID is exactly, I mean, board ID allows to match a device, a Chrome OS device, into a certain model. So that if this is a Samsung RMA center, they don't want to allow them to modify uh, Acer devices. So this is why board ID is part of this. So um, basically the server uh, verifies all this information and then it recalculates the same authentication code because uh, it can figure out the se uh, secret based on, the, on this um, uh, product again in, the, in, the, in this particular SEC space. And then it returns the authentication code to the, to the operator, I should say. Yeah, th this uh, QR code here is the uh, indication that once the H1 calculates this uh, challenge for the server, the Chrome OS device displays this QR code so that the operator can take a picture. This will uh, uh, direct them to the server, so to the certain server URL, which will include this uh, uh, challenge and the server will verify everything and display that 40-bit uh, value, which is like uh, five characters. And the user will have to type that 40-bit uh, value on the Chrome OS uh, console. And once this value matches, the H1 uh, checks the match. And if, it, if there is a match, it wipes out TPM, disables write protect, and reboots the device. So at this point, all the previous user um, information is wiped out and the device is ready to be re-imaged uh, by the uh, RMA uh, personnel. So another nice uh, uh, extension is the pin login feature, which uh, basically, this is a typical use case in schools, for instance, when there, is, uh, there are several thousand of students and several thousand of Chromebooks in the school, and uh, they don't want to, to tie any uh, Chromebook to any student, and they don't want the students to have to type in long passwords because it's sometimes uh, tedious and uh, kind of uh, considered a bad uh, uh, user feature. So the, uh, there is a, a map of... Uh, so basically the pin, pin is a, like four-digit uh, uh, low, very low entropy value which the user uh, can enter instead of it, it, their password. But uh, we don't want the, the users to be able to try many things, obviously, and we don't want to user, uh, the user to be able to uh, uh, do this uh, too quickly. So the, uh, all this code running on Chrome OS side, it creates, for every user, it creates this uh, structure which including uh, indic um, information about the user, and then it keeps track of how many attempts were made, when was the last attempt made, uh, matches the uh, pin code to the uh, actual uh, pa user password, which allows to um, uh, mount user's uh, uh, file system uh, when, when user logs in. And it also, it is protected by the uh, Mac calculated by the H1. So, 
each time uh, a user wants to log in. And so these are the nodes which hold information about the users, and the rest are just hashes of the uh, underlying nodes. These are, this is a Merkle tree. Each one uh, stores the root of this tree, and it, uh, it, um, the fact that each one stores it guarantees that there is no way, for instance, for the user to power cycle the device and then uh, turn it back on, and uh, the history will still be there. And basically, this provides additional level of security for this, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, for this feature. And yet another thing is uh, the U2F support. This is uh, pretty much it implements the uh, standard FIDO protocol, but uh, the, the key is stored in the H1, and the power button, again, is used as the physical presence button, so that there is no need to plug in a separate uh, U2F key into a Chromebook. Uh, the user can just use it for uh, uh, second factor authentication. Uh, as it's supported by H1. So that's about it. Uh, if you have any questions. All right, so there are some questions. Questions? Let's start here. Quick question. Um, you talked about disabling write protect. Uh, could you explain about uh, how it enables back? How it enables well, back the, the conditions to re-enable write protect after you're done. Well, uh, first of all, there is the uh, when when you uh, so when this CCD is enabled, uh, one of the URTs which are available through this uh, through USB is the UART of this uh, of the H1 itself. You basically, you have access to its console, so you can write enable, write disable on the console. Then uh, it has this, <coughs> so the, the CCD uh, mode has a, a set of, a list of properties, f and one of them is uh, flash write enable, what, what state it is in. So if the user, even if the device is in uh, developer mode, the user can set this property that if a CCD is closed, CCD is a closed case debugging, if the session is closed, then the write protect is enabled even though the device is in um, developer mode. And the CCD, once user enables CCD, it can protect it with its own, their own password. So that, you know, you enabled CCD, you made some modifications, you uh, disabled write protect, close CCD, then you can give this device to anybody else without knowing the password. They cannot reopen the CCD, even though it is in dev mode. So basically it prevents uh, modifications unless the user really wanted them to happen. Okay, two questions for me. Um, I'm not sure about the marketing of H1 chip, but does Google will sell that for integration in other hardware? That's uh, a kind of uh, interesting question. What happens is that uh, Google uh, could, you know, be selling these chips, but the thing is that the users won't be able to create their own firmware for those chips because the chips are, as we talked about here, all these uh, headers, all these signatures, uh, basically the, um, the, first, the very first key is saved in ROM, and then uh, the, uh, the, R, the RO image, it has to be signed with this key the ROM knows about. And this is a very uh, uh, tightly guarded secret, of course. The RW, the RW is... Uh, something which kind of is more lax, but it's still a key which the RO now contains the public part so that it has to be signed. So there is no way for someone to create a firmware and, and run on this chip because of this. Okay, so probably this, this is related to my second question. Uh, what about the uh, ability to inspect uh, firmware and, and ROM content by third party? So uh, the... This ROM is closed, and it mostly deals with the initializing the crypto engine and the random number generator. Uh, I'm, you know, I don't really know why would it be, um, or I should say, without knowing details of this hardware, which is not open, 
you probably won't uh, deduce a lot from this for, from this eight kilobytes ROM. So this is why, and as I said, this was designed in a different group, which uh, like, and this chip is used in many other applications. So this is probably not something which will be uh, shared anytime soon. But the rest of the firmware, um, actually, the arrow is also not released. It is. Um, but it, what it does, it also initializes some more hardware and verifies the RW. It's most two of its uh, roles in life. The RW is uh, is coming from this repository. Hi. Um, one question about the TPM and the verified boot. Uh -huh. um, actually, the TPM itself does only measured boot, right? Um, so if you do verified or secure boot, how do you interrupt? Because um, actually this is like actively prohibiting the application processor to start? Or yeah, that's, uh, again, this is not, um, this is not new, uh, this is not something new which was introduced into Chrome OS with this chip. The Chrome OS uh, uses TPM for verified boot from the very beginning and uh, what happens is that um, the role of TPM in this case is just storing the version numbers of the firmware. So the root of trust for the AP is also in read-only. So the idea is that flush where the code runs, the read-only cannot be changed. I mean, there are ways to change it, but for this level of security we want to provide and we promise, the it relies on the fact that the user didn't modify the read-only firmware in the, of, for the AP. And once read-only firmware starts, it verifies the integrity of the read-write part on the AP. So the integrity can be verified like this. And then it could be a case that read, there is a compromised read-write firmware, which we want to replace. So for the key the firmware is uh, signed with has a version in it, and the version is stored in the TPM. So when we want to, when the new firmware, newer firmware runs, the read-only read firmware detects that the running version number is higher than the version stored in the TPM, and it updates the version stored in the TPM, and before it starts the read-write firmware, it locks that particular um, index in the, in the NVMM. So this is all it does, basically. So this is how, and if uh, the firmware, for instance, the key number, the version in the firmware is lower than the version in the TPM. It shows this uh, screen showing your system uh, is damaged, Chrome OS, firm, uh, Chrome OS system is damaged, you need to repair this, basically. And it, it falls into the uh, so-called uh, recovery mode. Uh, maybe maybe follow up, uh, because uh, for me it's still not clear. Um, so are you actually using the H1 to verify the, the application process of firmware? No, no. no. I, I, which way does that code run which does the comparison and the decision? That code runs in the AP firmware. This, the, all, it, okay. all the H1 does is stores the number. Hmm. And that number it cannot be modified or until, uh, unless the read-only firmware is running. And we trust read-only firmware. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dimi, uh, and I have uh, two questions about the design. Uh, so the one is the info memory, and the other is about the reset. And uh, I can actually answer maybe the question that was before a bit, that in general the TPM does not have a storage to store the measurements and do the processing. A TPM in general only measures and has internal PCRs, and that's my question related to, so the actual integrity measuring software or managing software is actually run by the application processor. Uh, so uh, the question about the info, if you can go back to your diagram. So the info memory is a special memory that is restricted access. The question is, is this protected only by the MPU or this is a actually in hardware isolated memory that you have some hardware procedure to gain access? Yes, you have, well, the hardware procedure controlled by software. So, so it's the, is it a memory protection unit or is it a more specific hardware procedure? It's, you can call it memory protection, yes. Okay, and then uh, the TPM reset is not a uh, H1 reset. Right. That's a trade-off. Uh, 
No, it's not a trade-off. That's basically, uh, that's the... Uh, um, that, that basically, to what it means to me, uh, because we, we, we're using uh, TPMs in, in ours, uh, like I'm ro working with TPMs. So, uh, what does this, this means to me is that H1 can be running and can be holding my TPM in reset. This is how it sounds to me. It means that it the TPM reset is separate and can be held by the H1. Yes, this is Basically true. breaking my system. Well, H1 can do a lot of damage to your system, uh, even without, <laughs> yeah, even without holding TPM. Yeah, yeah, but but but, but it could be it could be basically no denial of service without just doing anything anything else they, they, by, by just holding a reset. Yeah, you know, as as you are saying, like if you look at this. Uh, yeah, there I know you have all the all the all the SPI access, but you need to enable the, the book. I'm talking about remote where I, I gain access to the H1 firmware or whatever, and then I can just apply reset to the TPM. My system won't be even boot. You can apply reset to the EC, and uh, like you don't worry about TPM. It's like everything is completely so shut down. So why this trade-off? Why, why is this trade-off? This is not again. This is not a trade-off. This is actually intentional because we want the, the closed case debugging running even when the AP is in reset. Okay. So, but we don't want the TPM to be uh, to to miss the reset because the like when the AP is reset, the TPM has to be reset to get into the highest security uh, level. So this is why uh, the AP the H1 firmware is running, it can give you all the access to these things, to program these, to, co to the consoles, to your measurements, whatever. But it also guarantees that when the, a when the, basically when the EC is reset, when the EC reset pulse is generated, the TPM is reset also. This guarantees that the TPM so is in sync. So it happens at the same time? It happens at the same time. That's it guaranteed. This is guaranteed that the TPM is in sync with the rest okay. of the system as far as the EC and the AP are concerned. Okay, quick last question. Do you have a, a time uh, estimate for when the, the open silicon design will be released? And then it doesn't have to be Google selling? Because no, but that was announced. It was announced that the, 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 the Google will be opening the, the actual the design of the, ch of the chip eventually, making it possible for manufacturers to produce. And then you, as a third party, can buy from someone who got the design from Google, developed it further, and fapped their own IC. The SP300 is an ARM design. Yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about the H1. They said that they're going to open the H1. I don't know anything about okay. it. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks a lot for answering. So what's Chromebook's threat model around limited physical attackers regarding closed chassis debugging? So are there authentication or unlock mechanisms for holding the system in reset and having write access to SRAM or read-only memory? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. We always uh, balance between uh, providing high level of protection on one hand and then still keeping these things open to, you know, to, to the user all, all owns this, and the user should be able to do anything with it if, if they so desire. So, uh, for CCD to allow access to the device, so a few things have to happen. First of all, the, this uh, firmware management parameter uh, has to allow uh, enabling the device mode on, the t on, the, on this Chromebook. So, if this Chromebook is uh, enterprise enrolled, then there is no way to switch into the so-called de developer mode. So if this is not the case, so this is a hobbyist or any user uh, who has this, so they have to switch Chromebook into the developer mode, so-called developer mode. This is the inherently less uh, secure mode where the user is supposed to replace, to be allowed to replace the firmware. The write protection is still enabled. So in this case, when the device is in uh, developer mode, the user can send the command through, uh, through the interface from the AP to, this, to the H1 and tell it, I want to open CCD. And at this point, the H1 will request the user to indicate physical presence. So the user will have to keep pushing this button for a few minutes in different uh, cadence. This basically confirms that the user is here at the device. It's not somebody trying to do this remotely. And at that point, the device opens and you can do anything with it. Does it answer your question? Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. So is it, uh, is the, does the threat model include an attacker who uh, opens the case and rewrites the AP flash and 
would it be possible to extend the firmware to use that, that MUX to ver validate the flash prior to release and reset? And then as a follow-on, uh, do you uh, expect that boot guard and other hardware support will be enabled on these uh, devices to further protect the flash? Well, it's, um, as far as the uh, owner opening this up and replacing, uh, oh, I'm out of time, sorry. Open this up and replacing firmware, there is no protection from this. Again, this is a Chrome OS uh, concept. This is not a H1, uh, something which H1 brings into the system. So, yes, if the user can uh, replace the flash chip, they can do anything they want. But, in this case, this will fail. Because, so if, if this AP flash was modified by the user, then uh, these hashes will be wrong, and the H1 will uh, highlight that. <coughs> the boot guard, again, it's a completely orthogonal thing. It's, uh, uh, it's something which uh, H1 doesn't care about. It's, uh, this is the AP thing, and, you know, if, if we decide... Uh, there are the people who uh, can answer that question, like Duncan there, for instance. Uh, speaking of which, we have so many questions, but, you know, time is few. Uh, we're going to have lunch now. It's a 90 minutes break, so you will also have enough time to keep on chatting about everything here. I guess you will be around. Yes, I'm, I'm glad to answer any more questions. And by the way, Martin is going to give a talk about CCD specifically, right? That's uh, my plan. I've got to still organize it. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, perfect. So, thanks again very much.